me start recording so I can repost this later. All right, thank you for joining us today. Um, for many years, I have been in and out of the port of uh, Dundalk in Maryland there in Baltimore, so I wanted to chime in on this today because I have been watching a lot of information go out about this that is just absolutely incorrect. First of all, I want to start off uh, by saying that uh, I started out in the U.S. Navy, learned a good deal about boats there. I was Aviation Navy, but learned a lot about ships and everything else while I was in the Navy there. Uh, went on to be a truck driver for a lot of years, um, in and out of the port of Dundalk over and over and over again. Been across that bridge many, many times in that amount of time. Um, and for a period of time, I mean, I've worked on ships, uh, doing different things, welding, construction, things like that. And so I have worked on everything from a kayak all the way up to United States Navy aircraft carrier, actually doing structural repairs to the ship. So I, I do know my way around ships fairly well, and I do know my way around diesel engines fairly well. And some of the things that I see putting out, totally, totally wrong. And so I wanted to dive in and do this live stream today just so is that I could dispel some of the rumors that are going on out there. Because some people are being like, oh, this is a black swan event, whatever else. It's crap. That's not true. It's not a terrorist attack. Looking at it, I would say I am fairly certain. Like, I'm about 90% certain I know what's going on with the ship, why it happened, what happened. And so on this video, we're going to dive into that. I'm going to dispel as much of the rumor as I can. Um, hopefully, this gives everybody watching some insight into that. So let's go ahead and get started. Also, I want to say that this is speculation on my part. I don't have any type of inside information. I'm just going on what's publicly available right now. And so going off of that, keep that in mind that this is my best guess, but it's a very educated guess. So let's get into this here. We're going to start off by talking about the ship. Now, this is the uh, motor vessel Dally or the cargo vessel Dally. It is a heavy displacement ship. I've got the general characteristics over here. Uh, this thing is almost 1,000 feet long, 984 feet. This sucker is huge. And so there's three numbers here for the um, weight that you're looking at, which is your, your, your max weight is your DWT there. And that is 116,000 tons. And so breaking that down, that, that means that this ship, all completely loaded out, can weigh 200 million pounds. This thing is a monster. Top speed, 22 knots. She was only doing about seven and a half, eight knots when she hit the bridge. So that was not as fast as this ship can go. And so let's go ahead. The next thing we're just going to dive into right here, the ship hitting the bridge. And so here she comes. She's coming along, making way, leaving the port. And this video does have some on-screen graphics. I grabbed it off of Twitter just because it had a really good job of the graphics. Bam. It's saying first power loss here. The lights go out on Broadway. And... They're fighting it. They're fighting it. You know, things are going on. The ship is just kind of coasting there. And they're saying recovery. Bam. There's the lights again. The ship's already starting to turn. Th huge plume of black smoke. And then, bam, the lights go out again. Lights come back on, but it is already too late. And pretty much at this point, impact is imminent. Luckily, you notice that the lights from the cars going across the bridge have stopped. And bam, there we are, collision, and she just comes down instantly. I mean, what, what a crazy thing that is. And so I'm going to bring myself back in here so you guys can see me. We're going to watch this over again, and I'm going to break down the key things that I noticed here while this was going on. The first thing we're looking for is the first time that the lights go out. You notice there's no black smoke coming out of the ship at this point. And so it's coming up, it's coming up, bam, the lights are out. And then in a second, they'll come back on. There we go. Lights come back on. And as soon as the lights come back on, thick black smoke. And to me, what that indicates is that they probably lost their generators. Well, you know, because the lights went out for one, but for two, that thick black smoke, what that's telling me is that they've got a fuel problem. And, you know, for whatever reason, their secondary generator didn't immediately kick in. These ships should have a secondary generation system on it that I would think would want to be automatic. Now, that's not... I don't know that there's any regulation that says it has to be automatic. Don't don't get me wrong there. But you would think that that system would want to be automatic. Now, a lot of people have said, well, you know, it was hacked. It was, it was designed to go down like this. Well, the problem with that is, is on ships that I have been on anyways... Now, this ship is fairly newer than stuff I've been on, so keep that in mind. 
But to have a link to the internet off of a generator, it's generally just something down in an engine room where someone has to go down, push a button, and start the thing to get it online. And then it just runs for months on end, and they, they, they'll shut it down to do maintenance on it. But while that one's shut down doing maintenance, they'll have another one running. So I don't know if that blink in between was someone just running over and starting the other machine. We'll get into that in a minute more, though. And so the next thing I really want to cover is we have the whole ship track from the time it leaves the docks here. So let me put play on this. You're going to see how far this vessel was into its journey here. Um, you'll notice we're just kind of getting started. Oh, no, come on, it didn't play for me. You'll notice it was just kind of getting started. You'll see it kind of bump just a little bit as the tugs are moving into it. Now she's slowly moving away from the dock. Uh, so she's got tugs that are positioning the vessel. And then now she is starting to come out and... Uh, She's being wrapped around. You notice that real flat side of the curve there. She's got a tug pushing her bow. Um, we're coming out here now. And basically you can see towards the end there how she just swerves right into the bridge like that. Now the next video that will come up in this playlist here, this will be the tug, the Eric McAllister, that was one of the tugs that was working on her. I believe that this is the tug that was on her bow. And so we're watching the Eric McAllister over here down by Tradesport Atlantic over on the uh, right, lower right-hand side of the screen. It's going to come out of the port here. Um, you're going to watch it go down. And it's just, it's just slowly making its way out of the port there. It's coming back in. You'll notice it's actually going to come right underneath that bridge. And it will come down. You know, actually, probably the last... <laughs> ironically, the tug is probably the last boat to go under that bridge um, with it before it got hit there. And so it comes over, it stations over here right off of Dundalk. It's sitting there waiting, and then it will, within a couple of minutes here, we'll just kind of speed it up a little bit. Because you can see that it goes from a, a point to a dot, which means that it's sitting still. And then within a minute, it will pop up. It'll go over to the ship. And then there it is at the ship that goes to a dot again. That means that they're hooking up right now. They're getting a line onto the ship, essentially to pull it out and away from the dock. And so Eric McAllister comes up, and you can see it's moving now. It's going out. Now watch what happens with the arrow of this as it's going around the bend. And that's why I think that this is the bow vessel, is you'll notice that it's pointing that direction as they are pushing it around. So the front of the tug is in contact with the ship at that point. And then Eric McAllister just goes right back to the dock. It does a loop by the dock, does a touch and go, and then it goes back over to what I'm assuming is their terminal, and then the collision happens, and then they run back south. And then you can see the tracks, all the spaghetti mess from everywhere it was there. So we'll go to the next video now. And the uh, next video is the other tug that came out, and I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming that this is the one that handled the stern of the vessel, because on the, then they might have had more than this. I might not have found them, but I know that these two were at least involved. So here comes Bridget McAllister popping over up against, the, you know, doing what it's doing there, getting hooked up, probably at the stern. And then within a minute here, we'll see them start to move again. So there she is. She's coming away from the dock now. You see her go still and then start moving again. Coming out, just kind of watching everything as it goes around. You don't see any hard movements, so it probably wasn't pushing, just chasing. And then she just runs right back for the dock there. And then you'll see her park at the dock. So she was already back in her mooring. And then here she comes, chasing back after going out. Um, and then, you know, back down to the spaghetti mess. The, the, the accident's already happened at this point. And so the, the whole point that I want to make with this is, why didn't these tugs chase this boat all the way out of the harbor? They should have. Um, it should have been in regulation. Like, they should have been required to chase this boat all the way out of the harbor. And the fact that that didn't happen really concerns me. Um, and we're going to dive back in. And another reason why it really concerns me, we're going to dive back into this video here. And you're watching as she's coming up. We're going to fast forward a little bit, fast forward a little bit. We need that smoke. Power come on. There's that smoke. You notice that smoke just goes right sideways right away. There is a lot of wind going on here. And what happens on a boat, is, is on, or even on a ship, is as soon as you lose power, the wind takes control of the bow because your rudder is at the back of the boat. And so it's controlling your motion. 
they don't have any controllability of their rudder, so their rudder is now not able to handle it. And on a, on a big ship like this, without the engine running, the wheel can't move the rudder because on something this big, I'm guessing it's a drive-by-wire system where it's actually an electric uh, actuator that drives a hydraulic ram that steers the rudder. And you have to have this big generation plant going on because you need to have these big electric motors that provide hydraulic power for that rudder to spin. So as soon as you lose power and you don't have those pumps running anymore, you don't have any hydraulic power, you can't steer the ship. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm really, you know, honestly, I'm surprised that they do not have a secondary system that was meant to keep the rudder going on this thing. That, that really surprises me. On a military ship, you know, we've had that since like the 1940s. Steering has their own engines that run that. I, I've not been on the ship. I don't know how it's constructed, but it was really surprising to me that they did not have that and that as soon as power went down, it was just lights out. I, th I think that's a very serious de design flaw. And in my opinion, having a separate engine for that, you're having a, your own generation equipment that control your rudder and enough power to the bridge to where your steering system is always going to be online, that would have gone a long ways to help prevent this. And so... Let's jump into the next scene here. And so the next thing I want to point out, you've got the ship at the end of its track here. So we are going to, I need to hop onto that and set it in the right position here. As it's coming down, you'll notice it starts to shove off to the side here. Well, why does it start to shove off to the side there? It's because we've got this massive amount of wind coming from this direction. Orange arrow is showing where the wind's coming from. So they've got a northeasterly coming here, and it just grabs hold of the bow of the ship, and it just starts pushing it around. And that is exactly what you'd expect to happen in a power loss situation. You've got that wind coming across, and it, it's and also the, the other thing that can drive this is the rotation of the shaft itself will cause the boat to slowly come around. But more so in this situation, I'm guessing looking, you know, if we go back to this video here and we, we look at where that was, where the smoke starts coming out with how fast that smoke is going to the side, you've probably got 15, maybe even as much as 25 knots of wind going there. I mean, that, that's some strong wind to make the smoke that's coming out of the stack go directly to the side. And so the, the tugs, in my opinion, should have been chasing this boat. That, that is a huge oversight right there. And that's why it should have been policy that those tugs follow that ship out past this critical infrastructure they should have been with it the whole way there's no reason that they couldn't be and when you look at it it is only three and a half nautical miles of the trek from the dock all the way around you guys saw those tugs make the trip there is no reason why they shouldn't have just been able to shove out of there follow that thing till it was clear of the bridge to make sure that in these windy conditions that it didn't ram into the bridge you know why is it that they just headed back for port so quickly Every time a ship this size comes out of there, they should have been doing that because it's it, just for the fact that it is going to take years to rebuild this bridge. And so let's get into looking at the aftermath now. Now you can see that pylon where the ship rammed into it. Terrible destruction. I mean, uh, totally obliviated it. The The concrete just literally exploded um, and, and came apart. And you can see why the bridge came down the way it did is because the concrete pylon underneath the bridge supporting it was just completely decimated. It explodes into basically where all that's left is the rebar because all the concrete just shatters away from it with the force of that impact. I mean, you know, two million or uh, 200 million tons of ship ramming that thing doing about eight knots, which is over 10 miles an hour. And so that's that's clipping right along. That is a lot of force involved there. And it just completely removed the support structure. And that's why it pulled the entire bridge down. And so talking about why this happened, why the generation systems could have gone down, is the next thing that I want to get into. And what we're going to look at for that are fuel filters. Now, this is a Raycor dual fuel filter. Now, mind you, I'm not saying that Raycor had anything to do with this. I don't know if their filters were on the boat. I actually chose this because this is a really good fuel system. This is what I have on my own boat. I chose this because it's good. Don't think this is bad. Don't think I'm disparaging Raycor in any way by showing their product up here because I'm not. The the thing that I wanted to show about this is you look on here and it's got this yellow arrow on the valve here. And what that does is it tells you what fuel filter, this is a dual filter system, which filter is the active filter that's actively drawing fuel from your fuel system. And so why these are really great is if you get in a situation where one of these gets clogged, because how this filter works is the top canister up here, that's your particulate filter. So it's got a, a very fine filter in there. It's just a paper filter that goes in there that filters anything out that's coming in in the fuel. And then in the bottom of this filter here, it's a small centrifuge that basically spins the fuel in there, causing the fuel to rise to the top and the water to sink to the bottom. And then these little ports down at the bottom here, they're drains, so is that you can drain the water out when it gets in there. 
And then the uh, other little thingamabob in there is where you can screw in a sensor. So if you do have fuel in there, it can actually detect that there's fuel and turn a warning light on in your dash. Great piece of kit. But these generators should have and more than likely did have something mounted on this like that. So when the generator went down, if it was a clogged uh, fuel filter, all they had to do was run over, kick this thing over, and then it would fire up immediately. You know, you just hit the button, start the thing they would have been back in business, assuming that the thing didn't lose its prime because diesel engines, if they lose their prime, are notorious to start. And so one of two things happened there. They either had to flip one over like this or they went over and they started a secondary engine and then that secondary engine went down. If that is the case, if that is what happened, there's something I'd like to point out here is when we go back to the bridge aftermath, you can see that it's it's still really dark soot coming out of that smaller stack because those are their generator stacks, and it looks like it's got one, two, three of those on there. So I'm counting it probably at least three generation systems that are down there coming out through those smaller stacks. The one on the other side appears to be the bigger stack. So we don't exactly know what those are for, but that's what we want to get into looking at there. And so if they did have a secondary generator, they fired it up, it goes down right away. Why might that be? Well, what that boils down to is a centrifuge, and on a big ship like this, you have really big centrifuges. Remember at the on the fuel filters, I was talking at the bottom in the bowl down here, how that piece there will spin the fuel on the bottom. Well, it's the same action on their big um, centrifuges where they polish their fuel that's going to go into what's called a day tank. So you have your storage tanks on the ship where you put your bulk fuel in, and then you have your day tank, which is the tank you're going to use to burn the fuel you're going to use that day. And so in between the two, when you're pumping that in there, you're going to have one of these centrifuges that just spins really fast. And I've even got an internal drawing on one of these. So basically you can see there's layers where the, the untreated uh, fuel oil comes in from the top. It's spread out. This thing is sitting here spinning around like crazy. And what that does is it causes the water to go to the bottom and it causes fuel to rise to the top. And so what you're doing is you're getting clean fuel out that doesn't have any um, water in it, and it doesn't have any particulate in it either, because the particulate that might have come in with the, the, uh, the fuel, meaning solids, uh, it all gets slung out to the sides because it's heavier than the fuel. And then so your clean fuel is able to go out the top. Well, the thing is, is if you don't run one of these, the fuel can just go right through it and take everything with it. Or if you're not running it properly, if this thing hasn't been rebuilt in a while because they do get gummed up on the inside, these are a maintenance item. Um, Chief McCoy actually uh, made a really good video on that that is very well worth the watch. But if this thing wasn't being used properly, it wasn't being maintained properly, that can allow bad fuel to get into the day tank. And then everything that's drying off of the day tank is then subject to having problems. And so if they were feeding tanks to run their generators from that tank that had water or fuel contamination or you know, just some, some bad fuel, and I mean, fuel can go bad, although with uh, diesel oil fuel, it is far less common than it is with gasoline. The stuff is a lot more shelf stable. But if that happened, what it means is, is that it got some bad fuel in there and instantly the power plant went down. And that right there tells you why all the lights would just go out at once is the generator gets bad fuel, shuts down, or if it's got some water in it, shuts down. So either they go over, they flip over like the Raycor, you know, where they flip over the secondary fuel filters, fire it up, it runs for a minute again, and then fills with bad fuel. They might have just restarted the same generator, freaking out like, oh my god, you know, fired it up, it runs for a minute, and then quits again. It is hard to say what happened down in the engineering space. That will absolutely be something that we need to wait for the investigation to see. And so... Getting into why this is the probable cause, because I know there's a lot of different theories that people are passing around out there, terrorism, black swan, everything else. Well, like I said, on these generators, they are probably not tied to the internet. So because they're not tied to the internet, there's no way to just reach in and be like, oh, bup, we're going to shut them down. It doesn't really work that way. And so for the way that would have to work, um, you'd, you'd need a lot of things interconnected there. And I mean, it's possible. It could be done. It could be done. I don't want to say that it's impossible. I'm just saying it is not probably the cause. What I do think is more probable is the fuel issue. And why I think the fuel issue is the problem goes back to up here in the state of Washington with the good old Washington State Ferries. This is the ferry Walla Walla that I believe this was in 2022 ran aground on uh, Bainbridge Island in Rich Passage just uh, between uh, Bremerton and Seattle. Why did she run aground here? Well, the reason she ran aground here was because they got dirty fuel in her. They weren't maintaining their fuel polishing. They weren't The engineers weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing, and it caused their generators to go down. They lost steering. 
the uh, the ship wound up on the beach, and uh, then everybody had to be emergency evacuated from the ferry. You can bet they were absolutely mad about it. And so that being the case, that gives you a really good understanding of what type of things tend to happen when this goes on. That ferry was coming up to where it had started to turn the corner when the engines quit. And then it just continued on. It, it just lost its track. The rudder straightened out without any hydraulics behind it. And she just went right up onto the beach. So the next thing I want to get into here is talking about the bridge construction and what could be done differently when they do this again. Um, a couple of things to note here. On the bridge, if you're looking in this photo, they're kind of hard to see. You've got the two main span columns. And then from the one that's on the right there, you look down, there's this thing sticking up in the water. That is uh, what's called a dolphin. That is a pin that is driven into the sea floor. And the idea of that dolphin is that it should protect the bridge from anything coming in and hitting it. The problem is, is that the ship that came on and hit the bridge was coming in at such an angle that it cleared the dolphin. And so they did have some protection there. It's not that the bridge was unprotected. And then around the base here, you have all this cribbing that is that's put around the pilings there, which is nowhere near really enough to stop a ship. But if something small runs into it, it'll absolutely protect it. Um, again, you can see in this photo here at the base of all the wreckage there, down on the lower uh, left-hand side here, you've got that uh, dolphin sticking up there. You can see that it sticks up. It's got a little light in the center of it. That thing right there is supposed to help protect it, but you could just see the angle that the, the ship came in on that it just, it was able to reach out there because that bow is so proud. I mean, you look there, the angle of the ship, like it hasn't even hit the base concrete really at the point that the bow is already making collision with the bridge pillar. So you'd, you'd need a very offset uh, bumper right there to help with that. And then we'll kind of go in again here and you can see as well that it actually threw the thing down over the side. This is on the north end of the bridge looking down towards it. And so you can see just how violent that collapse was pulling everything down there. I mean, it's just wild. And so I hope that gives you guys a really solid understanding of why it happened. There's one more video that I want to jump into here, and then we'll get into the questions and comments and everything else that have come in. So I'm going to show you, I just showed a video, if you go back, a uh, boat crashed here, but you can see dynamite being let off at every single point. I'm going to do it again. So we have here, 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 charges, boom. And so I, I don't know if you guys can hear the audio on this, but it doesn't really this, matter. The guys pointed see it out happen six or seven it's a conspiracy video right going around. You probably see these like, oh, there were dynamite charges set on the bridge. Look at all these flashes. Those dynamite charges set on the bridge. And you know what? Here, you do see that going off, those big flashes there? That is not a dynamite. These explosion. videos that is going like they'd like us to cover, but make sure you put Diddy in it. P. Diddy. I'm going to show you. I just showed a video. If you go back, a boat crash here. You can see dynamite being let off at every single point. Point. I'm going to do it again. Here, 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 so you, you get more efficiency when you're using higher voltage on lighting like this. So they're, they're probably using 240 volt or 220 is my best guess here. And so when the, the bridge is coming down, the, the conduits that those cables are running through, they're snapping and then they're, they're making contact with each other and they're arcing and sparking. That's what, that's what happens. That's, that's an electrical flash when that's happening. So I just wanted to go and I'm going to show you, I just showed a video if you go back, a, a boat crash here, you can see this dynamite being let off at every single point. I'm going to do it again. So and if this here, was actually here, um, here, a uh, charges, boom. the thing is you have a lot of thick black smoke with something like that that happens. You don't have a On the copy before that you can clearly see it happen six or seven times. I went right down the line showing each and every fire point. But my point to this video is let's not get distracted by this. Here, any time you're around something that's exploded, keep, there's like that black these videos going, going like, like they'd like us to cover, but so make sure you put Diddy in it. This one P. Diddy. And now, let me pull the chat up here and I will get into everybody's comments. Caleb popped in. Good evening. Been hearing about this all day on my long drive back home. We have more questions than answers right now. I hear you, man. It's That's why I want to do this, because I just saw so much crap that people put out here that just was absolutely not true. It was just incorrect. People are like, oh, this is DEI. This is whatever else. You know, this is probably dirty fuel is what it was. 
And really, we need to be seeing, you know, what did the engineer do? What what was the engineering plan going on in that space? That right there is going to tell us more than anything about what's going on over and above any anyone's speculation or hiring practices. And, you know, people are like blaming Joe Biden. Well, the ship is registered out of Singapore. It's probably, it, I believe, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that the chief engineer is Indian and that the captain's Ukrainian. So that's not really Joe Biden's policies that did that. Um, although who I could blame, I mean, if I really wanted to assign some blame at a governmental level to this, is I would say that Pete Buttigieg is absolutely culpable because they should have had it be policy that every time a boat leaves the berthing there, that the tugs escort them out. I mean, it, it just makes sense. There is not enough protection around that bridge. It is an older design bridge, and that's just the nature of the bridge being older. And so it should have been policy that those tugs leave the dock. And for anybody that would say, oh, my God, that's so expensive. Well, the thing is, those tugs have a minimum call-out time anyways. They, they are billing for a minimum amount of time. I don't know if it's two hours, five hours, what it is. I don't know their business practices, but I know in anything like that, they are going to have a minimum call-out time that they call out for their business. And so the fact of the matter is, when those tugs were running back there to assist in the rescue, they were probably still being paid, you know. And I don't want to say it's the, the tug driver's fault. I mean, it's just that you're going to get done with the job, you're going to go back to the dock. But I would say at a DOT level, Department of Transportation, that they should have known better, that they should have said, hey, we have this bridge we need to protect here. Hey, we've got tugboats over here already doing the job. So anytime we have a big ship leave the dock, we are going to have that big ship escorted out, especially when you've got like 20 to 20 knot winds, because that ship is almost a thousand feet long. And it's probably, what, 140 feet out of the water. So that is a massive, you know, that that's a massive area for the wind to push on. And so when you consider how hard that wind was blowing, it didn't take a lot to shove that ship over into that pillar just like it did. As soon as it lost power, bam, there we went. So that was a huge oversight. And, you know, that I, I would totally blame transportation. Uh, excuse me, Transportation Secretary Buddy Judge on that? You bet. Blame him all day long for that. That is something that is a very critical thing that was not looked after, that should have been taken care of, that wasn't. So there we go. Okay, WBBall15 says, How many times did you pick up and deliver there? Oh, man, more than everyone in this chat has fingers and toes. Um, I mean, I, I trucked in and out of that port for probably 15, 16 years. Uh, I was hauling stuff out there, I mean, several times a year, like 15, 20 times a year for 15, 16 years, sometimes more, maybe sometimes a couple less, but I saw Dundalk a lot. Like, I, oh man, like I, I know that port really, really well. Like I've driven across that bridge so many times, it's not even funny because like I used to go over the top of that, I'd leave the, uh, you had the TA truck stop down there, I'd drop my trailer there, which they get real mad at you for doing, um, but you know, I, I had a way of making it work because I could on my RGN I could leave the neck way down so they couldn't tow it, they couldn't do shit about it. So, um, without the neck on the trailer and you know being as heavy as it was with the load sitting on it, I wouldn't do it unloaded. But loaded, I just point the neck way down at the ground and then they couldn't get anything underneath it to try and pick it up or mess with it or you know they couldn't safely tow it, so they just had to say, well, tough, you know, and wait till I got back and I'd run over. Go, I, there was a Target and a Walmart over the other side that I used to run over to there way back in the day and a Costco. I'd go to Costco a lot. And so I'd go across that bridge to get there. So that, you know, as soon as it happened, I knew exactly which bridge it was. Now, Dorgi says, hi, howdy. Um, WB Ball says, 95k tons drifts. How far at 7.8 knots? Exactly. I mean, that, that ship had so much energy behind it. And that last run down there was less than a mile. It was less than a mile from the time that they lost power. So, you know, she, she had a lot of way on. You know, she was moving at about eight knots when they lost power and it started to back off. Um... And so that is that is definitely something. Um, Passim Quaddy said, I saw a, vi a video from another angle that looked like an explosion. I have seen that video too. And what I suspect that was, let, let me dive back in here to do, do, do the bridge aftermath. Yes, this one here. You notice this first level of containers here. They are absolutely mangled, right? And there's a series of containers that are missing in there as well they're probably at the bottom of the ocean now and you can see like some melted stuff some concrete everything else what i am assuming happened there is that one of those containers had something in it that was highly explosive maybe like lithium batteries or something like that i mean there was something big that exploded in there so what it was i don't know i'm assuming that it was something in those lead containers though so because they they do haul a lot of um 
you know, fairly toxic stuff like that. And so we, we have no idea what it was. I mean, hell, for all we know, it could have been ammunition and explosives in there because they do ship that on these ships. So it, this thing could have very well had actual explosives in it. It's really hard to say. We don't know. We'll want to definitely wait till we get reports on that. Okay, back to the chat here. And then did he use Caleb sent a message but redacted it. So I think we're all covered on that there. Oh, we got one on Twitter here uh, coming in. Uh, Best Nash Transit said, can you talk about why there were no tugboats escorting the ship out of port? That is actually the that is the big question we're all, we've all been asking. Why wouldn't they do that? That's the thing that really bothers me. And, you know, we can go back in there. Let's go back into the ship track. We'll go into the next video here. So this is the tugboat. So you see the tug come up. He does his thing, comes over, and then we'll scoot down to the end here. And he goes in, they come out, and then you see his track. He immediately drops away. Like, all he'd have had to have done is just come that rest of that distance down because look at how fast he covers that distance coming back. You know, all he would have had to have done is follow it down to the bridge and then bam. You know, but he they could have been right there. They could have been able to stop it. I really don't know why. I don't know if it was policy. I don't know what's going on, but in my opinion, those tugs should have been escorting all the way through that bridge. There is there is no reason those tugs shouldn't have been doing that. And it should have been at the federal level policy that that happens to protect that bridge because of how important that bridge is to commerce and to the port. And then I guess one other thing I want to dive into on the end is how is this going to affect our economy and everything else? Well, obviously, everything that's on that ship, all of the cargo on that ship right now, that's a big problem. It's going to have to get pulled back over to the port. It's all going to have to get set on the ground, unloaded, cataloged, dealt with. They're going to have to get another ship in there to get it loaded up on, get it sent out so that shipment's behind. And what's going to make it really crazy trying to do that is that the bridge is in the way right now. So they're going to have to get another ship in there to load everything onto. And they're going to have to get that bridge out of the way because that bridge is still lying in the water. So with that bridge still lying in the water, we have got a real problem as far as getting all that handled. So that, that is going to be a really big problem. And, like, let me just dive back into the aftermath photos here. Like, you look at this big mangled mess of steel there. They're going to have to get a huge crane in there. Or they might be able to use demolition explosives. They might be able to get, like, a demolition team in there to just come in right quick and in a hurry and just blow it all up. I know that that channel in there is fairly deep. Um, I, don't, I don't know how deep it is right in that spot there, but it is pretty deep. So we're just going to have to see what it takes to do that. But um, I will definitely be looking at that to see what happens. You know, it's it's going to be huge because first they've got to get the bridge off of the ship, which is going to require a heavy lift crane to do that. So how fast the port can get open, I would say, depends on where is the closest heavy lift crane. I think the Navy has one down around Newport News in Virginia, so that's like a day away. So they could have that thing already up and running and headed that direction. That that might already be happening if the people running the show are competent, because this is the other thing that's really going to affect how fast this happens, is how competent are the people in charge right now? The Biden administration, I don't trust. Pete Buttigieg, I don't trust. So I suspect that this thing, if those are the people running it, it's going to be bad. Um, it's going to be slow. It's not going to get done very quickly. So I would not expect the port to open quickly unless they have someone who comes in there who is not one of these idiots that they've hired, but someone with some real experience to run the show, to get things handled, to get that bridge moved out of the way. If we get someone in there who is highly competent about getting that bridge out of there, they should be able to have the port open quickly. But how long it takes to open the port to where it can start servicing ships again, that is going to be a really big deal because right now a major piece of our economy just disappeared. It just got wiped off the board. And so does it take a week, two weeks, three weeks? That's what we got to find out. Whichever way it happens, that's going to be a really big deal. So let me double check again here. Oh, we got another comment in here on YouTube. <clears throat> Caleb says, I heard six months till the port is going to open. Not sure that's legitimate or not. I Six months, I, I don't think is realistic. Um, if it takes six months, someone's doing something really wrong because really, <coughs> excuse me, Heavy lift crane comes in, um, hooks onto that bridge, gets it out of the way. Because all they have to do is get that center span clear. And that is not that much stuff to get out of the way of that center span. It's not like the port facility itself was damaged. Now, as far as getting a new bridge put in there to replace that bridge, that is going to take years. I'm guessing three to seven years uh, before that bridge is back in place. And so... Then again, that makes argument, why didn't they have the tugboats protecting that infrastructure? It just makes no sense whatsoever why they weren't doing it. And actually, what's crazy is kind of when you look at it, 
um, right behind this thing here, that big white hair warehouse that's back there, that's actually the terminal this thing left from. So you could see what a short distance that was. And that's why it kind of angers me that they did not have the tugs escorting it. Because those tugs could have very easily come in when the thing was losing power. They could have run up. They could have shoved on the bow, pushed it over, at least got it underneath the span of the bridge, you know, okay, where it didn't ram into that piling. So the wind didn't grab a hold of the bow and bring it around. And then they could have, you know, had a little bit of time to get their engines running. And they probably could have completed their journey and everything would have been okay. But now, I mean, this this was a billion-dollar incident. This, this will cost billions of dollars to get this situation rectified now to get a new bridge put in there. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing three to five billion dollars is, is just a guess to get that bridge rebuilt and the, the three to seven years to make it happen. So that, that's going to be a really big deal. You, and also the other thing we got to worry about now that they're building a new bridge is they're doing this in Maryland. And Maryland, in this whole area in the northeast there, they've had a lot of brain drain. And another great example I can point to of this is uh, down in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, they're building a new harbor bridge down there, right? And they kind of went a little goofy and a little bit lax on the standards for engineering the bridge. And they didn't really double check the engineer's work. The city didn't. And so since the city did not double check the engineer's work, the engineer just signed off. This is what we want. This is what we're going to do. And they sent it. And so they got this bridge where they were constructing the bridge. And then some TxDOT engineers came in and inspected what was going on and said, oh, wait a minute, you do not have sufficient foundations underneath this bridge. And so that bridge project has now been extended like four or five years because the, they went in and they didn't do proper work figuring out the foundations on the bridge. So they had to go back in and reinforce these foundations, which took years to accomplish. By the time they had the fight about it, you know, the legal battle go down, the stop work on the bridge, getting everybody back to work. Because the problem is anytime something like that happens, is you don't just stop a crew from working. That crew has to go find something else to do because they've got to make money. When you take a crew and you stop work on a job, what happens is is that the, um, the, the company will go to the crew and be like, we're sorry, you guys are out of a job right now. You are laid off until we get back to work on the bridge. So they're not getting paid. They might collect unemployment. But what's going to happen is most of the people who are working on that job are going to go start dropping applications elsewhere. My camera just start, just started doing goofy things. Hope, eh, uh, we're at the end. I'm not going to mess with it. But that, that crew will go start doing other things. So once that crew shuts down, now all of a sudden, all the people that knew what they were doing on the job, most of them are going to go other places. And so a year later, when you go to start back up again, the construction company's like, okay, we'll work on getting started back up again, but we have to go rehire all these people that we let go or sent to other jobs or started other jobs. They don't just sit there paying that crew to not work. And so anytime something like that shuts down, then it'll continue on where, okay, now you have all the fighting that goes in. Now they've got to get, once you get your crew back in there, that takes time. So you got a legal fight that lasts a year, and then you got to get your crew back. That takes a few months. And then once you've got your crew back and got everybody oriented and you're starting the job again, now you're having to build all your processes over again. Everybody's having to figure out what's going on. Where is everything at? Where are the materials stored? What do we have? What don't we have? It's a huge process of restarting a job like that. And then they have to go back in and start doing the remediation work that is required. So that is a really big deal. And then they, once that work's completed, then they have to switch gears all over again and go back to continuing to construct the bridge. So if anything like that happens on this Baltimore bridge, which I, I suspect it's going to, just knowing it's the Northeast, you've got a lot of brain drain in the Northeast. A lot of people have just given up up there. They've shoved off. They've gone to Florida, aging workforce, everything else. If you want to see an area where DEI is absolutely going to screw this, it'll be up in the Northeast. This webcam is going a little bit nuts. Sorry about that here, guys. I think that is the end of the comments. Yes, it is. So I am going to go deal with this. Appreciate you guys hanging out. We'll catch you all later.